I'm excited this morning because I want us to look at seeing if we can differentiate between a distraction and a direction. Oftentimes we can have lives that are so busy that we end up having distractions. They can be good things, but it ends up being something that's a distraction and takes us down a path that we maybe didn't set out to go on. Sometimes the right direction can be right in front of our eyes. And so I want to start with a story here. Um, I have three boys, Emily and I have three boys, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. And uh, some of you here in the church have been so generous to help us out with some Legos. And uh, we've grown quite a collection of Legos. And so what happens is, is when they want to play with Legos, they're really only looking for one piece and they dump the whole basket of Legos, hundreds of Legos, literally all over our tiny little condo floor. <laughs> and so, we have a job to do. We have to clean up the Legos. This is a weekly occurrence in our house, okay? So we, it takes a little bit of coercion, a little bit of encouragement to get the boys ready to pick up Legos. The direction has been given. It's clear. They're set out on a mission. What the job to do is, is to take the hundreds of Legos here and put them in the basket. We should be able to see the carpet when we are done, okay? So that's the job. And they usually, after a little coercion, a little encouragement, uh, maybe even some bribery, they end up moving in the right direction. They end up clean, cleaning up the Legos and starting in. But it takes about, mm, give or take about 90 seconds before they start getting pretty creative. And that creativity looks like using different tools to help them with this monumentous task. They, well, usually the tools that they end up using are a, a, a toy excavator and their, their kitchen toy tongs, maybe a spatula, and the hundreds of Legos start getting picked up one at a time. It's as if the project is never going to end. And in fact, it doesn't because my youngest son, Luca, one years old, his favorite toy to play with is one that's just been put away in the spot that it belongs in. The job is being undone as fast as it is being, faster than it is being done. And so they were given direction, but it only took something small, something that they even had well intentions of. They had great creativity and it ended up going off course. The path ended up moving off course. They lost the direction that they were headed in. And that kind of happens with you and I as well, doesn't it? We can be headed in a direction and then all of a sudden, maybe we just get too busy. I think most of us in this room are in that season of life, right? We all, all are. We've got a commencement to go to. We've got graduation open houses. We have uh, sports. We have every single like choir concert and band concert and sporting event. And that's just ending the year. Well, then we're getting ready for summer vacation and the list goes on and on and on. And we're busy and we're busy and we're busy. And on top of that, we have things that we have to get done, right? We have our to-do list that never ends, just keeps growing. And it's so easy for us to put our heads down, for us to end up looking at our list, looking at our lives and missing those that are around us. Missing that as believers, especially, we're on a direction. We're, we're on a mission for the kingdom, a mission for Christ. And Jesus, when he was here on the earth as well, he had a mission. His was a mission that, well, it ultimately led to the cross. But at the same time, or and rather, he had time for the people that were along his path, the people that he ended up seeing along his way. And so the story we're going to look at tonight or this morning, <laughs> I'm used to teaching at night for youth group, <laughs> the story that, uh, that we're going to be looking at this morning, it's one where uh, Jesus was, was far along on his mission. In fact, he was just getting towards the end of it. Now, I want to take a quick side to remind you, Pastor Rick has been in a series called Kingdom Stories, where he's talking about parables that Jesus told parables, right? They're stories that are used to convey a message, but they also conceal a message. This morning, we're talking about a story, an event that actually happened. So let's not get those confused. Next week, we'll be back to the parables. It's going to be a good time. You will want to be here for that. This morning, we're looking at a story that actually happened, and it's a story that takes place in the book of Luke. It's going to be in chapter number 19. And so if you have your Bibles here, you want to turn to that. Otherwise, it will be on the screen as well. And it says this. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So I just want to stop right there. Jesus is on his mission. He's in 
He's going in a direction. That direction is toward Jerusalem. He's headed towards the city where he's going to be welcomed with a parade. And by the end of the week, he's going to be murdered. The mission that he set out to do in it, with his life here on earth. This is where we're at. It's important. He has important work to do. And yet, let's take a look and see what happens next. We'll look at verse number two. And it says, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. A lot of you guys that grew up in church are probably familiar with this story. You might even have a little tune going on in your head right now. If you came expecting me to sing that song, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you right now, but I hope that the rest of this doesn't disappoint you because I wanna talk about Zacchaeus for a minute. Zacchaeus was not a crowd favorite. Zacchaeus was not someone that people liked and there's a couple reasons for that. One of them is because he was a traitor. Zacchaeus was a Jew and he was a tax collector. And because he was a tax collector, that means he worked for the Romans. The Romans were an enemy occupying the region that they were in. So it would be like, he's on our side, but he's working for the enemy. So he's a traitor. In addition to being a traitor, or in addition to that, he was taking money from his own people and taking it back to the Romans. He was taking money to fund the enemy's oppression of his people. I don't care who you are, that's gonna leave a bad taste in most of our mouths, right? Like that is traitor on some of the deepest levels. Zacchaeus was a traitor. He didn't have very many friends in the community. People didn't care for him. But addition, in addition to being a traitor, Zacchaeus was a crook. You see, so what they were supposed to do was they would end up taking the money that the government told them to take. But tax collectors got to set their own wages and they had the whole force of the Roman army behind them. You had to pay it if they came knocking and telling you what you owed. Um, so they would have what the Roman government told them and then they would slap on a bunch of fees. Um, have ever, has anybody ever heard of a, a, a certain ticket master? It's, it's kind of the same idea as that, right? Like $35 ticket, oh, 150 at checkout. Where did that come from? Kind of the same idea, okay? This is where it might've come from, I don't know. But this is what Zacchaeus did. So maybe he said, the government says, I'm gonna charge you, or we need to charge each citizen $1. Zacchaeus says, sweet, I'm gonna charge everybody three. We're gonna pocket the two, send the one back to the government. And everybody except for the people who lost their money is happy and taken care of. This is what Zacchaeus was doing. And it was abuse and it was oppression on the deepest of levels. So Zacchaeus, he was a traitor. Zacchaeus was a crook. And on top of that, Zacchaeus was a chief crook. It says he was the chief or a chief tax collector, which means he was really good at what he did. Like you don't get promoted in anything if you're not good at what you're doing. So Zacchaeus, he was good at what he did. He was good at stealing money. He was good at taking money away from people and padding his own pockets and working for the Roman government. This is who Zacchaeus was. This is why people did not like him, why he was not someone that people took much of a liking to at all. And that got me to thinking a little bit. If you're a chief tax collector, a chief of any sort, you've reached a level of power. You've reached a level of prominence on some kind of a, uh, in, some, in some degree. And so what that tells me is that he was probably respected, not among the people that he was taking money from, but probably among tax collectors. He was probably respected among the Roman government. He had a position. He had a little bit of an authority. On top of that, not only was he a chief of this, but he was wealthy. That would have given him some level of social status, right? And so we have someone who was in some level of authority. We have someone who was wealthy and had some level of social status. I can't help but wonder if he was really concerned, someone who would be concerned about his appearance. The way that he came across and so because of all of that, this next part that he does really is interesting to me. It gives me a pause for thought. 
as we see this. In verse four, it says that he ran ahead of the crowd and he climbed into a tree. So in that day, they would have been wearing a robe and they're not going to be like stretch fit like all of our clothes today. They're gonna be tight, more like your curtains or something along those lines, okay? And so if you try to run in that, you're, it's not going to work out real well for you. So what he did was he would have had to hike his robe up. He would have had to take off sprinting to get ahead of the people. And then he had to hike his robe up again to climb up into this tree. In that culture, that would have been scandalous to show your leg like that, to act in that way. It wouldn't be surprising at all if I saw my boys running, well, they better not be running in the street, but if I saw my boys running and then going and climbing a tree, that would be something that's common. Half the time we don't make it to the park because there's an awesome climbing tree on the way to the park. It would be something that would be quite strange to see an adult do though. It would be something that would be scandalous something that would be childish, something that you could even say would be, well, risky. Zacchaeus took a risk to see Jesus. And that makes me wonder, as I've been working on this, I've been thinking about you, I've been praying over you. And I can't help but think if there's somebody listening online, there's someone here in this room this morning that's taking a risk to see Jesus. Maybe it's something if, if someone knew that you might be enjoying church a little bit, a friend of yours, a coworker, you'd never hear the end of it. Maybe if a classmate knew that you were interested in knowing more about this Jesus stuff, they would never let you hear the end of it. Maybe some of you guys have been hurt by the church. It's a risk that many of you are taking. It was a risk that Zacchaeus took. And I wanna tell you that God sees you. I see you. I've been praying over you this week. And my prayer is that your risk results in seeing Jesus. My prayer for you is that you're able to see above the crowd, above the noise, above whatever decisions you've made in your life, above the youth pastor speaking this morning, and that you end up seeing Jesus. Because I firmly believe it's worth it. And we see that in the next verses, we're gonna be, or in the, yeah, in the next verse, chap, uh, verse five of chapter 19. And it says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And I've, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus, he invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. This uh, wouldn't have been rude. This would have been an honor in this time. Um, it'd be kind of weird in our, our world today, but it would have been such an honor for Jesus to want to spend time with Zacchaeus. And you can see where the people got upset with that and um, upset that Jesus would end up spending time with sinners and with tax collectors. You see them grouped together in several different spots throughout scripture. And while they're upset at this, Jesus chooses to do it anyways. And we don't get to know what all happened at that dinner, which drives me a little bit crazy because I would love to know what went down. What, what happened in that room? What did they eat? What would they say? What, like, how did it all happen? But what we do know is that on the other side of that dinner, the tax collecting thief becomes one of the most generous people in town. And I think that might be all we need to know. He's giving away half of his net worth to the poor in Jericho. If he's taken anything from anybody that was not honest, he wants to repay them back four times the amount. 
Zacchaeus experienced Jesus and he was changed. And I feel like he would have had to field a lot of questions. And like most of us, when we're asked about our story, we kind of figure out a way to, to share different parts of our story in different ways. And some of it takes longer, some of it's shorter. And I think in the beginning, he probably would have summed it up in this way, is that Jesus, he saw me, he valued me, and he changed me. See, Zacchaeus, he was despised. He was overlooked. He was an outcast. He was pushed into the gutter, but Jesus stopped. Jesus was busy. He was on mission. He had a direction that he was headed. But he made the time to be able to spend time with Zacchaeus. He slowed his pace to be able to see the people that were around him. It led to Zacchaeus being a changed man after being seen and after being valued. Maybe that's something you resonate with. You say, I can resonate with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus before he was changed. I want you to know that God sees you. Oh, but Brandon, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the decisions I've made. You don't know the marriage that I've ruined. You don't know how bad I've screwed up my kids. You're right, I don't. But God does. And it's not scaring him away. He's still inviting you to come closer to him. He still wants to sit down at a table with you. He wants you to be able to see him. He wants a relationship with him. Today could be the day that you accept that invite. Today could be the day that you begin a relationship with him. Allow him to change you in the same way that he changed Zacchaeus. Today could be the day that you start off in a different direction. After we get done singing, we're gonna end up talking about what that looks like, ways that we can begin to do that. So there's a question that Pastor Rick asks us. Little pop quiz, okay? He asks this to us quite often, so we'll see how you do here. He says this, are people in your way or are they? Hey, Pastor Rick, I don't know if you could hear that, but there was some people that answered it. You guys did a great job. Are people in your way or are they on your way? And that's really what we're getting at today as we look at that distraction or direction idea. We're talking about people. Think about the people that you see as you carry on throughout a day, the barista at the coffee shop, the clerk at the gas station. Maybe it's that person who works right next to you, the person who lives in the house right next to you. We run into people all the time. And a lot of times it's the exact same people over and over and over again. And yet so often we let our busy schedules keep us moving. We don't end up stopping and seeing the people that are around us. And I'm not here to tell you that your schedule's bad. In fact, I would go as far to tell you that I believe for a lot of you, your plans, your schedule, your to-do list, might even be what God's will is for your life. But at the same time, he puts people in our paths that we have to see. Because for some reason, he's chosen to use you and to use me to make himself known here on this earth. He's chosen to use you and to me to be ambassadors for the kingdom and what the kingdom may look like. Jesus, while his plans were the most important plans, more important than any plan that you or I are probably ever going to have, he still prioritized the time to see the people around him. But that leaves me with a question. You see, because Jesus didn't have dinner with every single tax collector. We know about two dinners that he did have, but I'm sure there were more than two tax collectors. So how did he know which ones to have dinner with? How did he know which ones not to? Jesus didn't heal every single sick person that he came across, but he had the time for a lot of them. Jesus didn't show up and make every wedding party awesome, but he did for at least one. So how did Jesus know who to heal and who to pass as he was going on his mission? How did Jesus know which tax collector to ask to have dinner with and which tax collector to pass? That's the question. That's what we're gonna try to answer here in the few minutes that we have left. One of the things that we do know that Jesus did is he came here to do the will of his father. 
That's mentioned several times throughout scripture. And we see Jesus retreat away to spend time alone with his father, talking with his father, understanding the heart and the mind and the will of his father as he moved about the earth, making sure that he was doing the things that his father would have him to do. And so while our mission here on earth, it's different than the mission that Jesus had, we also can look towards someone for direction. And that someone is the Holy Spirit. He can give us direction in our lives. He can give us clarity in our lives as we move throughout the lives that he's given us here on earth. He can give us clarity in seeing who it is we need to see and valuing who it is that we should be valuing. You see, because if you stop for every single person, you feel like you should see every single person around you in the world, well, you're never going to do the other things that God's called you to do, and you're probably not hearing from the Holy Spirit. But if you're going throughout your life and you don't see anyone else along your path, everyone is just in the way, well, you're also probably not hearing from the Holy Spirit. So what is this balance? Paul talks about a couple different ways for us to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit, to connect with what that direction may be. And so I want to look at those. They're going to be found in Galatians in chapter number five. And we're going to look specifically at verse number 25 first. And it's right here on the screen. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step. That's an English translation of a word that was, um, it was a military term. It had to do with like marching orders, right? Marching together in um, like a platoon or a military group. Paul talks about in Galatians what it looks like to march in step with the Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, attributes of the Spirit. He gives us long lists, even just in this one chapter, of what it looks like to be someone who is walking in the Spirit, who's keeping in step with the Spirit and someone who's not. There's another song there with the fruit of the spirit for the churches in the room. I'm still not singing that one either. But, but there's this list, this list of love and joy and peace and patience, and it goes on where a few other things as well. This keeping in step with the spirit, it has to do with the intentions of our heart. Orienting the intentions of our heart to one that is a mirror of Jesus. One that's reflecting who Jesus is. Let me go a little bit further with this platoon example, okay? You're given the marching orders to move and you move. It's not a bartering. It's not a, a I'm gonna do this. And then like, no, you, you move. You're given the directions to move and you move. But your movement, it's intentional. It's in step with the other people in your platoon. Your movement is in the same direction with the people in your platoon. You have the same mission no one's getting left behind. But more than being focused on the destination of where you're headed, you're focused on the very next step. And this is what that keeping in step with the spirit looks like. It's what is that very next step? If we're talking about the concentric circles that Rick likes to talk about, that are our lives, these are the places we go, the people we see in our homes, in our jobs, in our schools, in our church. What would it look like in the platoon, the centric circle of our marriage if it were marked by one that was a fruit of love? What would it look like in our jobs, in our schools, if our next step was a fruit of joy? What would it look like here at Capital City Church we were marching in step as one platoon, as one group, as one body of believers in step with the Holy Spirit, one of peace, right? Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We have to walk in step with the Spirit. We need to be looking at the things that we're doing, the people that we're seeing, the places that we're going, and looking for how we can be taking a step with the spirit in these ways. That's what it looks like. This is the first idea that Paul talks about. The second idea is also in chapter number five as well, but we're gonna look at verse number 16. And it's just a small difference, but it's a difference. It says, so I say, walk by the spirit 
and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. So this idea is a little bit more abstract. If we are keeping step in the spirit, we're going to be able to walk by the spirit. Maybe you can use the phrase uh, in the realm of the spirit. It's a little bit harder to decipher, but it's extremely important. It's, it can be described as an awareness, right? An awareness of where the spirit is working in myself and also where the spirit is working in my family, in my coworkers, in my classmates. Where is the spirit at work in their lives? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we find out later. Sometimes we can see it in the moment. Either way, it requires us to slow down. It requires us to slowly walk in step with the spirit. And then we can begin to see this more abstract, this, this nudge of the spirit. Sometimes it happens in the moment. Sometimes you are around someone and you just happen to see that person needs an ear today. I just need to sit and I need to listen. They're hurting, they're struggling, they're alone. And that's what it takes. Sometimes it's something that you've never seen this person before. Maybe you have, have, have never opened your eyes to be, be able to see that, oh, this person is in need over here and you have a nudge of generosity. Maybe it's a nudge to go and speak a word to them. There's several different ways that that can happen within the moment. But for me, sometimes too, it's after the moment. Sometimes it's after a moment has happened, I don't even know it's a moment. I'm thinking about my day. I'm reflecting on what's going on. Maybe I had a weird interaction of some sort and I end up thinking to myself, man, I don't think I had anything to do with that. That had to have been the spirit at work in my life, whether it was he gave me wisdom to say the right things. Maybe it was he gave me wisdom to shut my mouth. I don't know what it was, but you can see where the spirit guides in those areas. When we keep in step with the spirit, we'll be able to live in the realm of the spirit and we can be in tune and have this awareness of where he's working. It's kind of hard to explain. I want to tell a story to help this hopefully make a little bit of sense. This isn't any kind of accolade to myself. It's just an experience that I want to share with you. Um, I was, a couple weeks ago, I was going to my favorite co one of my favorite coffee shops and um, they have parallel parking right outside the front door. It's a quick in and out. And uh, I just so happened to come around the corner and there was a truck in my parking spot. And I was a bit annoyed. I was just getting a grab and go coffee and one for my wife to make sure we set the day off on a great path. And this guy's in my spot. I'm a little bit annoyed, whatever. I'll park on the other side of the street. We'll get it all figured out. 50 more paces from the door, but my Monday is looking fragile at this point. As I'm walking in, I see a couple people that were by this truck and they're picking up garbage in the curb, pulling a few weeds in the flower beds by the curb, picking up some garbage there. I don't think it was a city of Des Moines truck, but it had like a picture of the Des Moines skyline on it. I'm not sure what the business was, but they were supposed to be there. It was their job to be there, to clean up the garbage, to empty the public garbage cans. And as me and my bad attitude are sitting in the coffee shop, I got to thinking, I actually am thankful for them. I don't, I don't like looking at litter. I don't have any desire to clean out a public garbage can. I was super appreciative of them. I've never seen them before, but I was really appreciative. So it took long enough for them to get my coffee that I changed my attitude. The spirit helped me change my attitude. And I just made sure there was one of them standing by the truck uh, as I was coming out. And I made sure to thank him. I said, thank you so much. I really appreciate your work. That was it. There was no life changing words there. It was that simple of you're doing a good job at your job and I, I see you. And the whole countenance of this guy changed. A huge smile was on his face. He was carrying himself differently even in the way he walked. I got back into my car on the other side of the street. He goes over to his coworker and I could see him. He's sitting there telling him this, 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 and he's pointing over at me and I'm like, okay. Like he's, uh, he's telling him the story and he starts to lift his spirit. It was nothing that I did. But the spirit opened my eyes in that moment. I didn't even realize it in the moment. I was like, oh, I had a poor attitude and now I've, I'm gonna try to do better. Um, and the spirit used a simple thank you a simple, 
good job at doing your job, for this guy to be seen, for him to feel valued. Never seen this company before. I still don't know what the company is. I don't know what his name is. I don't know what the rest of his day was like. But for a tiny little moment, I got to hear a nudge from the spirit. I didn't feel that nudge and say, oh, that's the spirit talking. I need to go say thank you to this guy. It just was an obedience of keeping in step with the spirit and ultimately trying to live in the realm of the spirit. We don't know what God is doing in the people around us, but he puts people like these guys quite literally in your way. But it's also on our way because the work of the spirit never ends up stopping. And so that's my question for us is, are we willing to be aware of where the spirit is working at? Are we willing to slow down? Think about the thoughts that are coming to mind. Think about the people around us, where they're headed, what they're going through, what they've experienced in their lives. We only know our context. We have to remember that as many people in this room as there is, as many people are tuning in online, there's that many stories happening. There's that many different contexts, that many different trials, and that many different celebrations all happening at the same time, and the Spirit is working in each and every one of them. And for some reason, God wants to use you and me to show the world who he is. He gives us the example right in Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus. He's on the mission, and yet he's open to the heart of the Father who opens his eyes, sees Zacchaeus, shows a deep, deep level of value for who Zacchaeus is, when very few people in Zacchaeus' life probably ever showed him any kind of value. There's Jesus seeing him, valuing him, and ultimately changing him. I believe he wants to do that for someone here today. I believe that he wants to use each believer in this room to do that for someone in your circles, in your life, in this church. Simply even coming to church with an expectation that the spirit is here and he is working and you get to be a part of that. It's an honor and a responsibility. How are we going to prioritize our time? How are we going to make time to look like Jesus, to be able to hear the spirit at work? My prayer is that we end up leaving from here, being able to follow the steps, being able to have clarity in the direction of where the spirit is leading. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for inviting us in on this mission that I have failed at. So many of us have failed at. Thank you for giving us another opportunity. Thank you for giving us an example of what it looks like. What it looks like to live out your will in our lives, the plans and the things that you've called us to do and what it looks like to slow down. What it looks like to see the people around us. God, I pray that you give us a desire, a passion in our hearts that's on fire for wanting to know you, that's wanting to be one with your spirit. Pray that you give us an intimacy with your spirit that, that we can't even begin to describe as we live lives that are marked by the fruit of the spirit. Pray that we represent you well as we go on this journey together in our families as we go on this journey together as a church of people wanting to be your hands and feet here in our community. Thank you for this message, God. Thank you for giving me the permission to, to share this message. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.